person, the son is often referred to as the second person, that is, the accessible you person, because he is accessible to us, having appeared in the flesh to forge a relationship with us on the Father's behalf, for example, John 15, 14, and 15, and having gained access to the Father for us, John 14, 6. The Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. Origin, from the first chapter of the Old Testament, Genesis 1, 2, to the closing chapter of the New Testament, Revelation 22, 17, the word spirit is used to refer to God, the Holy Spirit. The Hebrew and Greek words for spirit, ruach and pneuma respectively, have the core meaning of wind or breeze, and again there are important points to be garnered from the name analogy. Significance, the wind is a potent invisible force. Though we perceive it and experience its effects, we can neither see where it has come from or where it is going to. John 3.8 it can have everything from a gentle warming influence to a powerful chilling effect. Wind is thus an aptly descriptive analogy for the Holy Spirit's role in the plan of God. His invisible yet powerful support of good, Zechariah 4.6, and restraint of evil, 2 Thessalonians 2.5-8, in the furtherance of the plan of God, must not be underestimated. Person. The Holy Spirit is often referred to as the third person of the Trinity that is, the unseen He person, because unlike the Father, He does not speak directly to us, and unlike the Son, He has not been made manifest to us. Instead, like the wind, He is unseen by us. But like the wind, that does not mean that we do not experience His power in a very personal and dynamic way, John 14, 16 and 17, and Galatians 5, 22 and 26. Note, as should be clear from this discussion, the names Father, Son, and Spirit are thus representative of the Trinity's individual roles in the plan of God for mankind, and have been given to help us understand the relationships and functions of the three divine personalities in that plan. The names themselves must not be pushed beyond the clearly intended analogies to our human frame of reference, as outlined. This is no small caveat, for it is largely on the basis of the title Son, that heresies of the past have sought to deny the full and equal divinity of Christ, for example casting him as subordinate in essence to the Father as hyper-Arianism does. The case of the Spirit shows how wrong-headed such analyses based solely on these titles are, for the Spirit is not at all inanimate or impersonal, even though wind is a fitting description of his invisible yet powerful role in our Christian lives. He acts in a very personal way towards us, and towards the other members of the Trinity, John 3, 3, 5, Romans 8, 26, and Revelation 2, 7, and as our comforter encourager, John 14, 16. The relationship of leadership, Romans 8, 4, encouragement and empowerment, Luke 24, 49, we receive from the Holy Spirit are some of the most personal and animating relationships we shall ever experience this side of heaven. Trinity roles as seen from specific New Testament scriptures. Matthew 3, 16 and 17. Now once Jesus had been baptized, he immediately came up out of the water and behold, the heavens opened for him, and he saw the Spirit of God coming down like a dove and lighting upon him. And behold, a voice from heaven was saying, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Comment. The baptism of Christ had a much different symbolism from any other baptism John ever undertook. John had rightly understood the normal meaning of his unique baptism to be a visible act of repentance and a symbolic washing away of sins. This explains why he was reluctant to baptize the sinless Messiah, Matthew 3.14. But in the case of Christ, the symbolism is different. His entrance into the water represents his willingness to submerge himself into our sins, therefore to die for them whereas his coming up out of the water represents his resurrection. In this, the role of the Trinity in Christ's victory over death at the cross in death and resurrection is symbolized the Son who undertook the mission to save us from our sins comes back to life in his humanity. The Holy Spirit quickens him, 1 Peter 3.18, and the Father who sent the Son pronounces his work and sacrifice satisfactory, efficacious and well-pleasing, John 14.16. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another comforter, that he may be with you forever. Comment. This verse shows the Father in a position of authority, the Son interceding on behalf of believers, 
and the Holy Spirit being sent to help us. 1 Corinthians 12, 4-6 There are different gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are different ministries, but the same Lord, and there are different results, but the same God who brings about all results in all cases. Comment Here we see clearly the respective roles of the Trinity in supporting our Christian ministry and life. The Holy Spirit gives us our particular spiritual gifts. Specific ministries are said to be assigned by our Lord Jesus Christ, and the Father is said to oversee and empower the results of those ministries. God gives us the gift, the Holy Spirit, He empowers us. God gives us the ministry, the Lord Jesus Christ, we share in His mission. God gives us the results. The Father all effects are part of His plan. 2 Corinthians 13, 14 May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Comment. The Trinity is seen here from the standpoint of salvation, before, during, and after the love of the Father sends the Son to die for sinful mankind. The Son's sacrifice reconciles us with the Father by satisfying the requirements of the Father's righteousness and thus providing grace that is, salvation free to us since He paid. The Spirit unites in fellowship with God, all who accept this offer of grace, based on Christ's death, originating in God's love. Ephesians 3, 14 through 17. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father, from whom his entire family in heaven and on earth has received its name, that he may grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be powerfully strengthened in your inner person through his Spirit, so that, rooted and grounded in love, Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Comment. In this apostolic prayer of Paul, we see the Father as the authority to whom Paul prays. He prays for us to be strengthened by the Holy Spirit. The object of his prayer is that we may grow to be more like our Savior, Jesus Christ, and improve our relationship with Him in every way. Ephesians 4, 4 through 6 There is one body and one Spirit, just as when you were called it was in one hope that you were called. There is one Lord Jesus Christ, one faith, one baptism. There is one God and Father of all, who is over all, and through all, and in all. Comment. In this prissy of the unity of the faith, Ephesians 4.3, Paul reminds us of some of the most important common factors of our Christian faith. In doing so, certain aspects of individual Trinity roles are emphasized. The Holy Spirit's role in bringing us into the body of Christ through His baptizing of us into Christ and our concomitant hope of resurrection in Christ the Lord Jesus Christ's role as our object of faith and the Spirit baptism, by which we enter into union with Him through that faith, the Father's role as the unifying God of love, who knits His family of believers together in every way. 1 Peter 1, 1 and 2 Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to those who, though outcasts dispersed throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia and Bithynia, were yet selected in the foreknowledge of God the Father by means of the Holy Spirit's consecration, for the obedience in and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Comment. Peter tells us that we believers are elected to eternal life according to the Father's plan of salvation, the Holy Spirit's implementation of salvation for us when we believe, and the Son's work of salvation, in which and in whom we put our faith. Revelation 1, 4 through 6. Grace to you and peace from the one who is and was and is coming, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Comment. In John's salutation from the Trinity, the Father's eternity and imminent taking of possession of the devil's world, the Spirit's supervision of the devil's world, see Revelation 5, 6 and Isaiah 11, 2, and the Son's victory and conquest over the devil's world are emphasized. Trinity roles explained. When we are face to face with God, we shall know even as we are known, 1 Corinthians 13, 12. Until that time, our understanding of God in three persons is essentially dependent upon the way the Bible reveals the Trinity in the process of carrying out God's plan for human history. Here the different roles taken by the Trinity in several aspects of administering that plan are considered. The plan of God, authorized by the will of the Father, Ephesians 1, 11. Executed by the word, the Son, John 1, 1 through 3. Administered through the wisdom and power of the Spirit, Zechariah 4, 6. Creation of the world, directed by the Father, Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 3. 
carried out by the Son, Hebrews 1-2, empowered by the Spirit, Proverbs 8, 27-31. Revelation of the Word. The Father expresses the Word, Isaiah 55, 11. Christ is the Word, John 1, 1-3. The Holy Spirit reveals the Word, 1 Corinthians 2, 10-16. Christ's first advent. Christ is sent by the Father, Hebrews 10, 7, conceived, Matthew 1, 20, led, Matthew 4, 1, and empowered, John 3.34, by the Spirit, as he carries out his ministry of self-sacrifice for our salvation. The victory of salvation, 1 Corinthians 15.54-57. The Father sends the Son on the mission, John 3.16. The Son accomplishes the mission, Hebrews 10.7. The Holy Spirit supports the mission, Matthew 3.16. A reconciliation of the believer. Though estranged from the Father, Ephesians 4.18, we are restored to fellowship with Him through the mediation of the Son by means of His sacrifice on the cross, Ephesians 2.12 and 13, with the Spirit acting as the agent of our renewed fellowship, Philippians 2.1. Regeneration of the believer. The Father holds the key to eternal life, Romans 5.10 and 11. The Son purchased access to eternal life by His death for all who believe in Him, Acts 3.15 and 20.28. The Spirit quickens or regenerates believers. John 3, 5 through 8. Walk of the believer. The Father sets the standard of holiness. 2 Corinthians 7, 1. The Son is the model. Matthew 16, 24. The Spirit provides the power to live as God would have us live. Galatians 5, 16. Virtues of the believer. The Father gives us the example of love. 1 John 4, 7 through 12, by sending His Son, who is the object our faith, Act 16, 31, so that we look forward to our resurrection with a hope empowered by the Holy Spirit, Romans 15, 13. Spiritual gifts of the believer, given by the Spirit with specific ministries assigned by the Son and specific effects decreed by the Father, 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 6. Prayers of the believer, Offered to the Father, Matthew 6.6, 6, in the name of the Son, John 15.16. Accomplished in the power of the Spirit, Ephesians 6.18. Note. These examples are given to help explain and expound the Trinity as the Bible reveals the doctrine. But the division of labor suggested by them is not to be taken as strict in all cases. In most of these and other joint actions of the Trinity, there is overlap and further subdivision of responsibilities, which is often only hinted at in Scripture. To take the last case, for example, prayer in Scripture is almost always addressed to the Father. But Jesus does say in John 14:14 14, 14, that if we ask Him anything in His name, He will do it. A major controversy in the history of the Church, one that split the East from the West, had to do with the procession of the Spirit and the question of whether the Father only, John 14:26, or the Father and the Son, had sent Him. John 15, 26. In some sense, both are right. The issue turns on the Father's role as possessing original authority and the Son's role receiving delegated authority. Note the stress on role. Therefore, in our appreciation of the Trinity, we should be careful to restrict ourselves to learning what such scriptures actually teach us and not build dispositive doctrinal principles solely on deductions stemming from them. For one thing is crystal clear. From everything we may glean from Scripture, the members of the Trinity are undeniably one in their unity and purpose.